Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 14th of July. And this quick look at the week ahead with me, Michael Hewson. Got a, quite a lot to get through today, um, largely on the basis of the fact that this week ahead will actually be a look two weeks ahead, given the fact that I'm, I've, got a, I've got a week's holiday coming. So consequently, um, what I didn't want to do is not cover the Federal Reserve rate meeting, the ECB rate meeting and the Bank of Japan rate meetings that are due on the week beginning the 24th of July. So not only are we going to be covering the week beginning the 17th of July, um, because we've got some important data coming out um, in, in the week ahead, but also the week after is going to be equally important, particularly in light of the price action that we've seen so far this week. Um, now, last week, this time last week, I, I basically was scratching my head as to why we saw the big declines um, that we did in the latter part of the week. And I postulated at the time that it was largely as a consequence of those really hawkish Fed minutes coming on top of obviously a very strong ADP payrolls report and some strong service ISM data. And ultimately, the the minutes showed that Fed policymakers were looking at at least another two or three Fed rate rises, US rate rises between now and the end of the year. Now, obviously, the things have moved on since then quite a bit. Um, I, you know, I, I, at the time we were, we were talking about, you know, the potential for we saw a big spike in yields. UK gilt yields went over five and a half percent. We also saw a similar rise. In US two year yields, which made marginal new um, 16 year highs. And I noted at the time there was that big spike up there. Now, consequently, since then, we've seen a, 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 you know, a really big correction in those moves higher that we saw in the middle of last week. And a large part of the reason for that, and actually, I think for me, I, I was always skeptical about this idea that the Federal Reserve was going to hike by more than, say, two times between now and the end of the year. In fact, I was skeptical they were going to be able to do two at all, which is why those minutes were such a surprise. Now, since then, obviously, the, the debate has moved on. At the beginning of the week, we saw Chinese inflation um, come in at 0.1% year on year, moved further into deflation in the PPI numbers to minus 5.4. And consequently, we've also seen US CPI um, fall from 4% to 3%. But what was particularly interesting was that actually core prices fell more than expected. They fell below 5% to 4.8. And then we had PPI the day after, and if you recall what I said in my video last week, I suggested that PPI could actually be even more important and consequential in the context of what to expect from the Fed over the course of the next few months. And so it proved because US PPI um, year on year came in at 0.1%. So within, you know, within touching distance of def deflation, and core prices actually fell more than expected as well. They fought, fell to 2.6. So whatever Fed officials would have you believe um, about their desire to hike rates more than once, and July is going to be, July is going to happen. We're going to get a rate hike in July. The biggest challenge that Chair Powell will face, um, I think, at the press conference will be how to convince the markets that the Fed is serious about the prospect of keeping another rate hike on the table when all of the data points to inflation falling sharply and it being highly unlikely that they will be able to hike again. Um, we can also bear in mind that between the July hike um, there will be two payrolls reports, two CPI reports. And given the fact that PPI is almost on the verge of deflation, you're not seriously telling me that by the time September comes round, 
um, the data will support the prospect of another rate hike. I talked at great length last week about um, terminal rates and the likelihood of the Federal Reserve hiking by another two or three basis points. And the Bank of England in particular, the, the, you know, the prospect that they could actually hike rates as far as six and a half percent. In a sense, this week's decline in the dollar and, you know, and decline in yields makes the Bank of England's job a hell of a lot easier when it comes to their own fight against inflation. Um, and the reason for that is obviously cable's higher. So that has a disinflationary impulse on imports coming into the country. It makes them cheaper. But more important than that, it acts in a way, a, a higher pound acts as a rate hike anyway, um, by virtue of the exchange rate. What we've also seen is a big rebound in equity markets, uh, almost like a relief rally after the fears that we saw at the end of last week. And the relief rally sort of started on Friday um, and it's continued this week. And the FTSE 100 is held above that 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level, 7,200, 7,200. It's also a GAN number. So it's a really, really big support level um, around about 7,200 and we've held it. And that's a big, big relief because ultimately it keeps the, uh, the prospect of further FTSE 100 gains very much on the table and a move back to 7,500 and the highs that we saw at the start of this month. The FTSE is still underperformed. Obviously the Chinese economy, um, there are still concerns around that. And as we look ahead to next week, we've got second quarter GDP numbers out of China, as well as retail sales and industrial production. And obviously the trade numbers that we saw this week were extremely disappointing. Nonetheless, the fact that they were disappointing would appear to suggest that at some point, the, uh, uh, the People's Bank of China and Chinese authorities will um, bring in some form of fiscal stimulus um, or monetary policy stimulus to try and support the economy. At the moment, they're bringing in measures to support the property sector. But I have a feeling while we, we won't see large scale stimulus, we will see some form of measures to support the economy. And given the fact that this week's data out of the US has been broadly supportive in terms of the labor market um, and falling inflation, we've got a little bit of a Goldilocks scenario when it comes to the US economy. Now, the next few weeks are going to be a key test of that narrative because obviously we now have, we are now starting to move into earnings season. Um, today, we've got the latest numbers from JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. They should give us a decent insight into the health of the US consumer. More importantly, um, how these banks feel about the health of the US consumer, what um, loan demand is like, and whether or not we see further provisions in respect of non-performing loans. As we look ahead to um, next week, we also have um, further earnings numbers from the likes of Netflix and Tesla, um, Goldman Sachs, um, as we get underway in earnest. But overall, the rebound that we've seen thus far in equity markets hopefully um, will continue on the basis of the fact that the dollar should remain weak, yields will continue to come down. And really then it's just a question of um, how positive or not um, the, the earnings numbers from the various companies that are due to release over the course of the next few weeks. Um, in terms of the week coming up, Obviously, I talked about Tesla, I've talked about Netflix, um, but before I get on to them, um, I, I want to talk about, I just want to have a quick look at the, um, the various indices that I covered last week. So we got this little bit of a break lower. It turned out to be a false break um, or last week, at the end of last week. We're now back above and within this key support line um, and we could well see or look for a bit of a retest of the highs back in June. We're seeing a bit of a pullback today. That's entirely expected, given the fact that we've we've risen for five days in a row. You're going to get a little bit of a pullback, given the fact we're heading into the weekend. But what's more important is the range, more or less, of the last few weeks and months has remained intact. Similarly, the CAC, which I showed you last week, managed to hold above um, this support area, area here and also we're still above the 200 day moving average. So again here, 
Um, I think for me, we might need to get rid of this trend line completely because it's not really helping. We've got a fairly decent resistance level through these peaks through here. We've managed to rebound quite nicely. Um, if we do get um, if we do get um, some form of stimulus out of China, obviously luxury stocks will feel the benefit of that, you would hope. Um, retail sales numbers out of China next week should give us a decent indication as to how the, the Chinese consumer is performing. But I would argue they're not going to be particularly positive given the fact that we saw some fairly poor trade numbers out of China earlier this week. So for the China GDP, um, we have an expectation that the economy will slow on a quarterly basis to 0.6%. Um, as a reminder, um, the economy, the Chinese economy expanded or rebounded in Q1 to the tune of 2.2% as the economy reopened um, at the end of last year, um, came out of COVID and um, you got a little bit of a rebound, a Chinese New Year rebound. That has slowed. Um, so 2.2 to 0.6. Now, Chinese retail sales, um, that's going to be a slightly trickier one. I think the expectations are fairly low. We're expecting to see a rise of 3%. Now, when you consider that May rebounded by 12.7, that's a really significant slowdown. And it's it's more marked by the fact that a year ago, uh, the Chinese economy was still under various states of restrictions and lockdowns. So, you know, a 3% rise in retail sales in June is pretty poor. It's pitiful, if I'm honest. Um, and industrial production is also expected to slow from 3.5% to 2.5%. So those numbers are out on the 17th of July. So keep an eye on them because I think if they are weak, counterintuitively, the market may greet them fairly positively because it means that we could well get um, for some more easing from the Chinese central bank. Um, it's also a big week for um, the pound, the United Kingdom. Now we've seen some we've seen some middling, shall we say, economic data this week. May GDP um, was disappointing. We, we saw a contraction in the UK economy in May. Um, but we only saw a 0.1% contraction, and I think many people have been expecting a bigger one of around about 0.3. Um, so that would suggest that we did see some growth in the second quarter. Obviously, we've only seen Aprils and Mays, and but April and May GDP. June um, is likely to be better. Um, obviously, May was weighed down by the three bank holidays that we saw. They made the additional one because of the coronation. Also, see, we also saw an awful lot of strike days in May as well. And the way the UK measures GDP, it um, basically takes numbers from the health care, health and education. So there was an awful lot of public sector disruption there, which would have impacted those numbers. Um, the strikes haven't been as prevalent in June, so you should see a little bit of a rebound there. But the big numbers for uh, the UK, CPI, they are the numbers that will dictate whether or not we get a 50 basis points rate hike from the Bank of England in August or 25. Now, certainly the wages numbers that we saw um, earlier this week would appear to suggest that we are leaning towards 50, but it could be 50 and done, or it could be 50 and 25. Now, I talked last week extensively about my skepticism about a Bank of England terminal rate of above 6%. I think if the Fed stops hiking, then the Bank of England may only hike one more time or, or two more times after that, but certainly no more than 75. And the bigger question is whether or not they do 25 or 50 in August. So that for me um, is the big question. Now, obviously in, in May, we saw headline CPI coming at 8.7%. We've seen cable break higher on the basis that the Bank of England is probably going to be hiking more than the Fed. I mean, well, yeah, they are. I mean, I think the Fed is going to do 25 in July. The Bank of England is probably going to need them to to do another 50 at least. So if they do do if they do 25 in August, then it's highly likely that they could do 20 another 25 in September. I personally think that they need to do 50. 
um, in August and then see where the land lies in September because in September um, inflation could and should be an awful lot lower. What are we expecting for this week? Um, a slowdown to around about 8.3 is what markets have got priced in. I think that's entirely sensible. The energy price cap falls in July, so it won't be in the June numbers. So you could see a big drop in headline CPI, and, you, and we would hope to see a big drop in August when the July numbers are released. Unfortunately, the Bank of England won't have sight of that of next month. I think what's more important, obviously, is core, core CPI. because that's at 7.1 percent you know we want to see that come down we want to see it come down back to seven back into and have another six handle um by even of itself it won't change the calculus about further rate hikes but i certainly think it will add confidence that we won't see a terminal rate of above six so you could see pricing there start to come down because if we look at the way uk two-year gilt yields have behaved over the course of the past few days we can certainly see that that, that move higher that we saw um, at the end of last week has given way quite significantly over the course of the past few days. That is good news. If that continues, which I think that it will, then we could well see um, those that, that rate pricing come in quite a lot. I think an awful lot of people will be hoping so, as, as, as will I, because um, it certainly feeds into my narrative that um, irrespective of what happens, I still see the pound going higher because UK rates will need to stay longer, so will need to stay higher longer than, say, for example, the US. That should be supportive of sterling if the economy holds up. And yes, the UK economy faces enormous challenges. We've also got retail sales um, on the 21st, so we've got CPI on Wednesday, and we've got retail sales on the Friday, we've also got US retail sales coming up this week. Um, they should be um, fairly supportive of the US economy. I'm not expecting too many surprises there. But certainly, the, you know, I can certainly see potential for cable to go higher now or above 130, head towards 133, potentially even 135. I think we've hit um, a period of significant dollar weakness, um, which brings me on to dollar yen. Let's quickly cover that because. This is important in the context of what the Bank of Japan might be looking to do over the course of the next few weeks. Now, obviously, the week after next, I'm not doing a video next week because um, I will be off next week and for the first couple of days the week after. The Bank of Japan, there are some, there is some chatter that they could look to tweak the yield curve control um, when they meet at the end. Of July on the 28th of July. We've got the Federal Reserve, we've got the ECB, and we've got the Bank of Japan. Expecting a rate hike from the Fed, expecting 25 from the ECB. So you're getting um, rate markets between the US and Japan starting to diverge because if that is in fact the Fed's last hike, which I think it will be, markets will start to price in rate cuts. They won't come this year. They'll probably come at the end of first quarter next year because the US economy still remains fairly resilient. The unemployment rate is 3.6%. So there's no need for them to start loosening monetary policy. So the you know the bigger question is when is the next when is when when are the rate cuts coming? If the Fed does in fact go on pause for an extended period, not much before beginning of Q2. So whatever that, you know, however you slice and dice that, that essentially means that you're going to get um us rates um start to come in and that should be supportive of the yen consequently you should see dollar yen start to come down um it's held above its 200 day moving average i really don't know why that is um red and blue so i'm just going to make it red there we go so we've rebounded off the 200 day moving average got some fairly decent support there we we're in the cloud now but I would expect that to continue to come down over the course of the next few weeks. We could see a bit of a squeeze back to 140, but I think the direction of travel is set. We saw a bearish engulfing week last week. We've seen further declines this week. 
you could see a little bit of a consolidation could even squeeze back to 142 but i think the die is cast in the context of dollar weakness over the course of the rest of this year um, that should be fairly supportive of equity markets going forward and the bigger question is whether or not people are talking about us markets retesting their record highs yeah maybe maybe not i mean to be quite honest you've got to go with the trend when it comes to that so certainly i think if we look at the s p and we look at the nasdaq the trend still remains higher so you know can we retest those highs well the 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 s p's got a long long way to go before we even get close to that but certainly i think april highs back 46.20 that's that's in, that's entirely possible if we look at the nasdaq the nasdaq is very much outperformed over the course and it's now back above 15,500, which i must admit i didn't see coming but again back here um one of the key takeaways and one thing that you guys do need to be aware of is they're rebalancing the nasdaq on the 24th of july um, so the magnificent seven those big seven meta um, or mega stocks of meta amazon microsoft apple tesla um, nvidia they are all they make, they basically make up over 50 percent of the nasdaq 100 so nasdaq have decided to rebalance the index um, so that those numbers come down to around about just below 40 percent so there's not as much of a bigger weighting so you could see the nasdaq affected by the fact that those big seven um their weighting is being shaved by about 20 percent um off the nasdaq from 50 to just below 40 percent so you could see a little bit of a headwind there but overall still remain very much in an uptrend for all of those um, okay, so in terms of the earnings numbers, obviously we've got Tesla out this coming week, so I'll quickly cover that. And then obviously the week after next, we've got, um, um, apart from the Fed decision, the ECB decision, and the Bank of Japan decision, we've all got we've also got numbers, first half numbers from Lloyd's Banking Group, Barclays, Vodafone, Shell, um, NatWest Group, Microsoft, Meta Platforms an alphabet so a big big two weeks coming up let's first and foremost look at tesla another record quarter in terms of the number of vehicles sold um, coming back to 280 obviously the next target here is around about 300 dollars, which is the september highs i think the big question for me is yeah they've sold all of these cars but what impact of those sales had on their margins because one of the th notable things about this particular quarter has been the number of price changes that um, tesla has announced over the course of the past three months having said that there have been some big wins in terms of reports that many of its peers like ford gm volkswagen and mercedes would adopt its U us charging standard so that could um certainly um help it in terms of uh, um, price of use tesla's four-year production guidance is currently 1.8 million vehicles it'd be interesting to see whether or not they revise that up um, netflix password sharing giving it a really big boost but the big big chart point here on netflix for me well it's this gap it's this gap from january 2022 we gap down from here to here because of a profits warning um we've we retraced some of it but there's still this big gap between here and here so the big test i think this week um when they announce their q2 numbers will be whether or not um they are able to deliver q2 revenues of 8.24 billion dollars um with an expectation of profits of around about 1.28 billion dollars or two dollars and 84 cents a share now we could see a drop in subscriber numbers but that's not the issue the issue is because obviously um, if they, the crackdown on password sharing will incur what i would call is a little bit of um subscriber shrinkage but will the will the crackdown increase the revenue that netflix has managed to accrue over the second quarter more importantly um 
what does it mean for its Q3 numbers going forward? So 456 is going to be a big test for Netflix when it releases its third quarter numbers. Okay, so I've got on for long enough. As I say, I see the next two weeks are going to be big weeks for financial markets. Got a whole host of stuff to get through, which is why I've tried to basically cover as much as I can, given the fact that I'm off next week. But um, I, you know, I hope you all have a good um, good weekend and a uh, profitable week next week. Until the uh, same time, in a couple of weeks' time, this is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets. Thank you very much for listening.